Good morning. It's Tuesday morning. A great day uh, to get to know the Lord. And we're going to start by getting into His Word. We've gone all the way through the Epistle of 1 John. And today we're going to do uh, John's second epistle, 2 John. There's only one chapter, so we'll spend today in 2 John, tomorrow in 3 John, and then the next day in the book of Jude. I think that when we get done with that, we're going to jump into the epistle of James. So the difference between 1 John and 2 John is 1 John is more individual, focused on individual Christians, while 2 John is focused more on protection of the corporate body of Christ. And so we'll dive into that and examine exactly what this, uh, this book's about. But before we do that, I want you to stop right now. If you haven't already read 2 John, uh, go back and read it for yourself. Look at specific terms in it that are repeated over and over again. This is how you take, draw from the text what the text is saying, not what I think. I hear people say this all the time. Well, what it means to me is this. Well, okay, so let's be careful with that. The words that are on the page mean what they mean. Okay? The, the words can never mean what the author who wrote them under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit never meant for them to say. So the words have one meaning. We're trying to get to that meaning. Now, the application can have different applications for me. So um, I can apply it in different ways, but the words mean one thing. So let's dive into it, but let's go before our Father in prayer. Father God, we love you. We thank you for this day. It's the day that you have made, and we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. And so, Father, help us to know your truth. And Father, then, by knowing your truth, that your love will flow through us and that it will bring glory to your name and build up your kingdom. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I kind of tongue-in-cheek called this book Edify or Embalm. The church is either going to listen to what John is writing and it'll be built up, or we'll ignore what John is writing and we'll just die. So we can, we can say we're either going to build up the body or we're going to bury the body, one or the other. And in a day and age where even in our own state, hundreds of churches are closing every month, um, and you say, well, I don't want that to happen to ours. Well, it's got to come from a desire for God to work in, on, and through us. That it, It's got to be about his kingdom and his will. It can't be about our church and our will and our little uh, kingdom. And so the more we're obedient to what God has commissioned us to, the more he'll empower us and equip us to be able to carry it out. So as we dive in, John's going to give us uh, three basic choices. And so we're going to just kind of look through those choices as we first look at the introduction. Um, in verse 1, it kind of gives us the layout. Now let's understand what he's saying. He said, The elder to the chosen lady and her children whom I love in truth. And not only I, but all those who know the truth. So you're going to see this theme throughout the whole book. Love and truth. They go together. You, you, when you only have love, you, you have no foundation for it. Love just becomes this sympathetic feeling that I have. Um, rather than love being a choice that I make based on objective truth. So objective truth and love go together. As an extension from 1 John, 1 John, the objective truth was God's Word and the God's Spirit in a, a relationship with God. Uh, as John 15, the Gospel of John chapter 15 says, abiding in the vine. 
Okay, so this loving God with all my heart, soul, and mind is through the Word and through the Holy Spirit. That's the truth that he's speaking of, that whole situation. And that truth is the same for you and the same for me and the same for everyone else. Now, from that flows agape, godly, biblical love. Not the way the world defines love, but the way that God defines love. And this is going to be very important that we understand God's definition of love because he's going to ask us to separate ourselves from certain people and that this may initially feel unloving, but God's saying it's absolutely loving. So those two terms are going to go together in this text, truth and love. Now, who's he writing to? He describes himself, John does, as the elder. Now, this is a term that goes with two other terms, sometimes called a bishop or uh, sometimes called a pastor or a shepherd. This is the, the leader of, the, of a church, the pastor. And John is describing himself as their pastor. Now, at this point, all the rest of the apostles have been martyred. And we're left with just John. And John is writing... <clears throat> Excuse me, John is writing to these churches, and these churches have formed in houses, and he's very concerned that these churches continue on, because once the first eyewitnesses are gone, then it's going to be based totally on what God has revealed through Scripture. So he's the elder, he's the pastor, and he's writing to a lady, a woman that is in one of these house churches. Um, he calls her an elect lady. All that means is election means he knows that she is a born-again Christian. Now, how does he know? How can he say that she's a born-again Christian? Because she has uh, been born again. She has grown in her walk with the Lord to the point where now she is making disciples of others. When it says here, and her children... This isn't necessarily speaking of her biological children. I believe that it's speaking of the disciples that she's making. She, John knows that she is a believer because she is reproducing. Um, we go back to 1 John. This is how you know. The way God works is through these categories. Infancy, being born again as an infant, growing to a toddler, growing to a young adult, and then growing into a reproducing parent. So you can go back through and read 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. We'll lay that out for you. So not only the, just the disciples that she's making, but also it says all those who come after that are holding on to truth. So that's speaking to you and me. So this speaks to the first century church and to the 21st century church. And I think it's it's... We can see the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in what he's writing. He says, whom I love in the truth, and that's the key point. I love you, but I have to love you according to the objective truth of what God has revealed. It says, verse 2, for the sake of truth, which abides in us and will be with us forever. So what's he speaking of there? Clearly speaking of the Holy Spirit. The spirit of truth, which he described in John chapter 16. The spirit of truth that God's going to give us, the helper, the comforter, um, is going to be with us forever. Not just in this physical body, but when I die and receive my glorified body, the Holy Spirit is still uh, going to be with me. And look who it says, also God the Father and the the Son, Jesus Christ. So you see the whole Trinity right here at work. At work in what? Work in the local church body, um, in people who are born again and are reproducing, making disciples, fulfilling what Christ has commissioned us to do. God the Father had this plan. He sent his Son to be the substitute, to provide the bridge, and now the Holy Spirit is the one guiding us into all truth, illuminating us in this. And so what is the, 
three things here that are the outcome or are based on script based on grace mercy and peace boy these are grace getting something i don't deserve mercy not getting what i do deserve and peace peace how does this come peace is a person jesus christ through jesus christ i gain both grace and mercy the holy spirit is comforting us with this helping us to know that the condemnation is gone so now we can dive right into what the holy spirit is helping us with he's helping us to know the truth and it's going to be difficult to apply the truth to our individual lives it's going to be even more difficult to help other people uh, face the truth. So we come to verse number four. And in verse number four, I believe, is the first choice that we're going to have to make. And here, let me just tell you the choice. We're either going to walk in truth, which is objective truth. God's word is truth. We're either going to walk in truth or we're going to walk in opinions what people think okay so naturally we can all get together in our little groups and we can talk about what we think and it doesn't take any work we can just spew kind of whatever comes to the surface in our minds but god's not wanting that for us he's wanting us to know his revelation of himself god's word truth um, he said this in john 17 17 he's praying to the father that we would be part of this relationship that the Father and the Son has. He says, set them apart or sanctify them in the truth. And then he lets us know that his word is truth. If you go back in John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, remember it says many were believing. And he says, well, it's great that you're believing initially, but if you continue in my word, he says, then you're truly disciples of mine. And as you continue in the word, you're going to start knowing the truth. And the truth is what's going to set you free. And so look at with me at verse 4. It says, I was very glad to find that some of your children were walking in the truth, just as we have received commandment to do from the Father. So remember, John probably has many, many uh, these house churches. He has many people that he's discipled. And remember, the goal of making a disciple is that they will then turn around and make disciples. Um, I have really no desire in doing these videos or getting into God's Word with you just so you can have more knowledge and feel better uh, about how much you know. The point and the purpose is reproduction that you would take what you're learning and turn that around and teach someone else, make a disciple of someone else. There's no more encouraging news than to know that what a teacher is teaching, his students are turning around and reproducing in others. John is excited about this. He says, hey, some, some of the people that you've discipled, are carrying on to the truth and I would love to say all of them are but that's not generally the reality and so they're walking in the truth just as your father I think it's so easy to fall in in church without putting the work in to just start living by opinion we start taking it starts with the pastor just taking texts of scripture and just kind of preaching about things that people like to hear. People like to hear, get saved, get saved, get saved. Because the majority of the church that comes every week has already surrendered their life to the Lord. So they can sit in the church service and they can say, uh-huh, uh-huh, did it, did it, did it. And they can kind of check out. Rather than teaching the whole counsel of the, the word that goes through and speaks much more about Okay, once you've given your life to Christ, now how are you growing in Christ? And in order for us to grow, we need to be confronted with all of what God's Word says. So here he says, hey, your children, these people you're discipling, they're growing and they're knowing more about the truth and they're walking in it. They've gone from just being an infant in Christ now to being toddlers, 
and they're walking in the truth. They're walking in a relationship with God throughout the world. Um, when I was in college, our president was Dr. Paige Patterson, and he used to have this saying. He said, some people believe that the Bible is inspired in spots and that they're inspired to spot the spots, which is very dangerous. If we just take the word in part and we just talk about the parts that we like and that make us feel good, then, then we have really said the Bible is our authority. Now, my feelings about the Bible are my authority and I've turned from the truth to opinion and many, many churches do this. Um, ask yourself this question. Is there anything in my life that I'm doing that I know the Bible explicitly says not to do? Or am I not doing something that the Bible explicitly tells me to do? We live in a day and age where people say this, well, you know, well, we'll, we'll take, let's, let's take uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and chapter 3 about uh, the role of men and women in the church. And people say, well, I know the Bible says only men are supposed to be pastors and that women aren't supposed to have authority, exercise authority or teach men. But in our culture, you know, things are changing and you can do dot, dot, dot. Be very careful. When we're starting to take things from God's word that God's word says, and we're saying, well, you know what I think? Well, it doesn't really matter what you think. It doesn't really matter what I think, unless what we think is being run through the filter of what God's word says. Now, if there's something that the Bible doesn't specifically talk about, then we need to work through biblical principles Independence on the Holy Spirit that he would guide us in what to do. The Bible doesn't tell us what color the curtains or the carpet need to be. So we need to pray that we'll all be on the same page when we do these certain things. However, when it comes to what the Bible says, we need to be submitting to what the Bible says. And John says, I'm so excited to hear that you and your disciple, the people that you're discipling, are standing on the truth. It reminds me of what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians. He said, I was so excited that when I heard that you were standing in the truth, he said, you took what I preached to you and what I taught you, and you took it not as the word of Paul, but you took it as what it really was, the word of God. Now, uh, I hear this all the time in ministry and in church life. Well, Brother Dan says, and I don't agree with this, but what I'm preaching and what I'm teaching is God's word. But we, when we don't want to accept God's word, then it just becomes what Brother Dan is saying. But if, if you have a question about what I'm teaching or what another pastor is teaching or what a Sunday school teacher is, go to them, talk to them. If they can sit down and show you right from God's word what they're telling you, then you have to take that as the word of God, not the word of your teacher or whoever. So first, First choice, if a church is going to grow and, and work for the kingdom of God, it's going to have to be based, they're going to have to walk in the objective truth of God's word. If you want it to die, just start walking in opinion. Just what do you think? What's culture say? So next, second choice that we're going to have to make, and that one is basically a vertical choice. Okay, am I going to walk in what God says? Now we're going to walk in, this is the, the loving God part was the first choice. Now the second one is loving your brother part. Are we going to love one another, truly? Or are we going to just live and let live? Um, it's, it comes down to actually the question that Cain posed to God. Am I my brother's keeper? Am I responsible for someone else and clearly the answer biblically is yes we're all part of the same body so when one of my brothers and sisters is hurting or in sin that is going to affect me and it's going to affect the testimony of our head Jesus Christ in all the world so do I care yes 
I'm not going to say, well, if sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so wants to live their life that way, they can do what they want to do. I'm going to do what I think is right. In America, we have this general idea of independence in this. However, the church is not independent of its members. Look what it says. Now I ask you, lady, not as though you are writing you a new commandment, but that which you've had from the beginning. And what's the commandment? We've, we've seen this all the way through the Gospel of John and through the first epistle of John, love one another. The, he says this, he says, and this love that we walk according to his commandments. Remember, the commandments is the vertical, the loving each other is the, so um, as I love God with all my heart, soul, strength, and mind, the result of that is that I'm going to love my neighbor. And how am I going to love my neighbor? The way that Christ loved me, meaning sacrificing myself. Let's just remind ourselves of our definitions of love and hate. Love, I will deny me for you. That means I love you. If I hate you, I'm willing to deny you for me. What is he saying here? I want you to love one another. And look what he goes on and he says, this is the commandment, just if you have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. Do we have a responsibility to love each other? And what does that look like? Well, we've got to love in truth. He's connected these things together. So am I in charge of making sure that I'm walking in the truth? And the answer is yes. Am I in charge of helping someone else walk in the truth? And the answer to that is yes. We're in this together. Okay. So we can't just say, well, if somebody else is going to go out there and commit sin in this world uh, and they refuse to get it right, what am I supposed to do? Well, we, we talked about this yesterday from 1 John chapter 5. There's a sin leading to death for a Christian. This is any sin that I refuse to confess as sin and repent. Um, we, I gave you those scripture references yesterday. I'll give them to you again today. We've got Hebrews 12, 7 through 8. We've got 1 Corinthians 5, 5. We've got... 1 Corinthians 11, 28 through 30. We've got 1 Corinthians 3, 3, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 3, 14 and 15. And then we've got Matthew 18, uh, 15 through 17, what we generally call as church discipline. And I think when we get all the way done with Jude, I think we're going to take one day, um, one video, and just talk about what church discipline looks like. We'll, we'll frame it this way. We'll talk about the unpardonable sin uh, for lost people. And then we'll talk about this sin unto death for Christian people. And what it looks like to practice biblical church discipline. And really, the Bible says that if I love my child, then I'm going to discipline them. Okay, so in the church, uh, if, if I love each, if we love each other, we're going to have to have discipline. And this discipline isn't according to the standards of what we think. It's going to be the truth of God's word. Okay, so um, this is going to lead right into the result, the third choice uh, that we have. And this is going to take the rest of the book up, which is not very long. We're either going to guard the truth or we're going to guard feelings. Now let's talk through this again. First choice, I'm either going to walk according to the truth of God's word or I'm going to walk in what people think, opinions. Okay, um, I'm either going to, choice number two, I'm either going to uh, love one another or we're going to just live and let live, let people do whatever they want to do. It doesn't affect me. So if it doesn't affect me, I'm not going to bother with it. That love, loving each other means sacrificing for each other, and part of that sacrifice is confronting each other with the truth. Third choice, are we going to live guarding the truth of God's word, or are we going to guard 
people's feelings. Now let's look. It says this, verse seven kind of ties this. It says four. So the two thir first things. Now, this is the result. It says, for many deceivers have what? Gone out into the world. So they, they went out. What, what did they go out from? We already know this from 1 John chapter uh, 2. And look back with me at 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. It should be just a couple pages back to your left. It says, children, it's the last hour. And just as you've heard that Antichrist is coming, even now, many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they all are not of us. Well, what's the us, what's, what unifies us together is the truth of God's word. And if someone refuses to submit to the truth of God's word and to practice righteousness, then they're to be confronted about that. And if they continue in their rebellion, they're to be put out of the church as antichrist. Remember, antichrist just means they, they do not want to submit to the standard, the perfection of Jesus Christ. They want to lower it to something more attainable in our own strength. Okay, so really it comes down to, I don't want to deal with my own sin. I want to really say that my sin is okay. God understands. God does understand our sin and he's given us a process to deal with our sin. That process is the Holy Spirit and the truth of God's word coming together and producing conviction in the Christian's life. And from that conviction, the Christian then responds in confessing sin and then turning in, repent from, in repentance from that sin. So we've talked about this at great length. CCR, remember? CCR. Here it says, these deceivers, they have gone out into the world. So they, they've left the truth of God's word. And now they're trying to deceive people. And so as the first century, kind of the picture would be this. So there's these little pockets or home churches, small groups of believers. And John, being their pastor, maybe only came to them every once in a while. And so they were called on to be hospitable, to invite people into their homes, uh, what Jesus would call a house of peace. And so they would invite people into their homes and uh, practice hospitality. And John is wanting them to be careful. Look, it's great that you are hospitable, but there needs to be some kind of standard by which we give love to other people, okay? Then there was this danger of the church being so loving and open and wanting to grab people that they would bring these false teachers in. And once these false teachers were in, they would start teaching them things contrary to the inspired word of God. Let's see what he says. He says, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ coming in the flesh. Now, the fancy word for this is called docetism. This thought of uh, higher knowledge or Gnosticism, they believe that Jesus, uh, that all flesh, they said, was evil and that all spiritual things were good. So they said that Jesus couldn't have possibly come in a real human body because if he did come in a real human body, he would have been sinful because all flesh is sinful. Now, that's incorrect. Um, Jesus really did come as a human being, 100% man and 100% God. You'll find that all heresy usually hinges on one or the other. Either he, they don't believe that he was 100% God or they don't believe that he was 100% man. Anyway, whatever the heresy, it's minimizing the person of Jesus Christ, um, the one we're supposed to be elevating. He says, so, he says, this is the deceiver and the antichrist. Anybody minimizing 
who Jesus Christ is or the standard that he has set. The thought here is that God doesn't really care what you do in your body because all, all flesh is sinful. So you do whatever you want with your body and that's separate from your spiritual walk. It's the antithesis of the great commandment. The, the docetist would say, well, you know, love God with your heart, soul, and mind. And it really doesn't matter what you do with other people because your walk with God is separate. We, we have this still alive today. Uh, m more times than not, it comes across as, well, I'm a Christian, but I'm not going to make disciples. Um, my Christianity is more a private thing for me. Well, that's, that's heresy. If I truly have a walk with God, it's going to, the result of it is going to be a love for other people. And that love for other people is going to be sharing the truth of God's word with them. He goes on and he says, watch yourselves that you do not lose what we have accomplished, um, but that you may receive a full reward. So he's not talking about losing your salvation, okay? Because he's talking about rewards here. Now, get look at the pronouns. I love looking at pronouns. He says, what you do can accomplished losing what we have done together. So what one individual person does can affect the whole body of Christ. Okay, so think about it. If a whole body, a whole church, is working together for the kingdom of God to make disciples, and one person in that body refuses to deal with their own sin and to live according uh, to God's truth, well then they're jeopardizing the whole body. This is why it comes to the place where you have to say, no, you're out. It would be akin to a physical example would be if my finger got infected with gangrene. I go to the doctor and they try to treat this with antibiotics, but the antibiotics just won't take care of it. Um, it comes to the place where they, they say, I have to, we have to cut off your finger. Well, I like my finger, so I don't want you to cut it off. They say, if you don't cut off your finger, it's going to infect your arm. And then, then we'll have to cut off your arm. And if then you say, well, I like my arm, and I don't, want to, I don't want to get rid of my arm, then it's going to end up killing your whole body. And it's the idea in the body of Christ. If one member refuses to submit to the standard of Jesus Christ, the way we submit to the standard is by practicing righteousness, by being in the word by listening to the conviction of the Holy Spirit and responding in confession and repentance. As we do that, um, we're showing to be doing what God has told us to do. If, we, if, we, if one member refuses that, then this, this it, it's got to be dealt with in the church. It's got to be, if this person refuses to submit, then 1 Corinthians 5, 5, we put them out of the body so that God can deal with them out there to the point where they will come back into the body. There's a great example of this. 1 Corinthians 5, 5, there's a, a man who's having an adulterous relationship with his stepmother. And the church is accepting this. And he says, no, you've got to deal with this. So they deal with him and they put him out. And Paul says, so the, through the destruction of his body, his spirit might could be made right. So God's going to deal with him and his sin out there, and then maybe he will desire the relationships that, that he had in the church and be reconciled with the Lord. When we come to 2 Corinthians, it seems as though that actually accomplished reconciliation. It did what we all desire, is that when you put someone out of the church, the desire is that they would repent and come back and be reconciled. This is exactly what John said in 1 John 5. When we put them out, we're not praying uh, that God will kill them early. We're praying that they'll, they'll repent and be reconciled with God and that it won't be a sin unto death. We come here. He says, we don't want to lose what we, the body, are accomplishing. We're making disciples and every person that's 
teaching something different, that's living something different. It can't be about this. Look, look what he says. He says, anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, okay, so what is this teaching that he's talking about? This teaching is what we have called the New Testament. This, these letters that were going out to churches, these gospels that were going out, laying out the truth of Jesus Christ, laying out God's plan for the church. What is it supposed to look like? And that has held true for 2,000 plus years. And it will continue um, until the Lord comes back. Look what it says. This teaching, um, if you don't hold to the teaching, then you don't have God. You can't say, I don't believe the truth of God's word and say you still have a relationship with God because what you've done now is, and what I've done if I do this, is that I've, I've turned God into something of my own opinion, not what the objective word says. This is what's so dangerous. Even with the matters of roles in the church, of, of this day of feminism where um, people feel like, well, it's not right for anybody to say you can't do this. It's not right for you to say a woman can't teach any Sunday school. It's not right for you to say a woman can't be the pastor of any church. But the problem is that it's really a, an aspect of submitting to what God's word says the teaching. Are we holding to the teaching? And if we don't hold to the teaching, what we're going to forfeit or lose is first the power of the Holy Spirit working in us, and then the power of the Holy Spirit working through us in our community. We're going to lose what we're about. And then we're going to become this inward-looking club of people who just get together and talk about what they think. And in that, as this goes on for long periods of time, the church is going to die. Um, look what he says. He says, verse 10, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him in your house. Okay? Don't be hospitable to people who don't stand in the truth. Do not give him a greeting. Wow. Think through this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, it says don't be bound together with unbelievers. Uh, here he's taking it even further. He's saying, look, don't greet them. Don't bring them into their house and help them be comfortable. Don't give them a place to stay. Don't give them a platform for their false teaching. You say, well, that sounds very unloving. Remember, it's not love according to how you feel. It's love according to what God's word says. Jesus Christ has defined what love is. And that love is sacrificing ourselves for the truth in love from God and in love for other people. And here he's saying, look, the true sound doctrine, sound teaching, doctrine just means teaching, sound teaching from God's word needs to be the basis of whether we will fellowship with each other. In this day of uh, all churches need to come together and sing kumbaya, that we cannot do this. If you stand on God's word and I do not stand on good God's word, then we cannot come together and fellowship. Remember, there's two kingdoms. There's two ways of doing things. He, he ends with this. For those who give him a greeting, participates in his evil deeds. So we can take this as far as someone who's teaching in the church, someone who's not willing to submit to what God's word says. Either we're holding them accountable and confronting them with the truth as we're confronting ourselves with the truth. Or let's say a prominent person in the church uh, is in active sin and teaching something maybe contrary to God's word. 
And we say, well, you know, they've been a part of this church for a long time. And we, think it, we don't think it'll be that big of a deal to just, I love them and I, I don't, we're just going to let it go on. Well, here it says, guess what then we're doing? We're participating in the false teaching. So then the choice comes. Remember our third choice. Are we going to walk uh, guarding the truth of God's word? Or are we going to guard uh, the way people feel? Because i got to tell you, every time the Holy Spirit confronts me with the word of God, it doesn't feel good. And so if, Christian, uh, if your Christian life and fellowship with the church becomes all about how you feel and how you're making other people feel, I guarantee you, you will never grow in your walk with the Lord. And my desire for myself and my desire for you is that you would grow in the Lord. And that's going to take the truth of God's word and the power, the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. Now, that conviction, my dear brothers and sisters, does not feel good. Go read Hebrews 12. It's just the same way as your, your parents coming to discipline you and if they're going to spank you and they say, this hurts you, me more than it hurts you and you're thinking, that's a bunch of baloney. In Hebrews 12 it says, no one loves discipline. It's not comfortable. It doesn't feel good. But it produces certain things. It produces humility and submission. And that's what God wants from us. Humility and submission. He winds out the book by saying this, Though I have many other things to write to you, I don't want to do so in paper and ink, but I want to come to you and speak face to face so that your joy may be made full. I want you to be content and excited about what God is doing. He, he says, the children of your chosen sister also greet you. So the, another body, another fellowship, another house church, another uh church that's making disciples, they're doing the same thing. So it, it's kind of uh, tying it all together. So let's end with this question. Who do you love more? Who do you love more? Do you love God more or do you love yourself more? That's the question. If you love God more, this is what it's going to look like. You're going to walk uh, in the truth. You're going to love God other people the way that God loves and that you're going to guard the truth. Okay? Now, if, if I love me more than I love God, I'm going to walk in my own opinions. I'm going to let other people walk in their own opinions, live and let live. And I'm going to guard how I make other people feel. Now, I shouldn't be out uh, making other people feel badly. However, the truth of God's word has to override sometimes the hurt of how it makes people feel. Let's, um, let's finish with a verse from Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 4. So it's just a little bit to your left. Ephesians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And I think I want verse 24. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24 says this. No, that's not the word. That's not it. If let me let me get this right. Ephesians, yeah, 4:15. I'm sorry. In Ephesians 4, verse 15, it says this. Well, verse 14. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves carried about by every wind of doctrine, teaching, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and the deceitful scheming. How are we supposed to be protected from that? But speaking the truth in love. So speaking the truth, but I'm doing it, wanting you to be built up in the Lord, in love, we're to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. 
So if I'm part of a church and you're part of a church that's not growing, meaning we're not seeing new disciples come in, we're not seeing people being born again, it's just we don't see it happening. We say, why? Well, it's our pastor's fault. It could be. Or what this text is saying is every individual part submitting to the truth of God's word and growing. So that means every individual member growing through those stages that we've talked about in 1 John chapter 2. If that stopped, if that we refuse to let that happen, then the church is going to die. Um, I love Ephesians 4.29. In Ephesians 4.29, we'll finish with this. Let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth, but only... Such a word is as good for edification according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear. Sometimes that grace is confronting people's sin and sometimes it's very difficult to do. But we're going to submit to what God's word says. Not what we think and not how it makes me feel. So Father, um, help us today. Help us know your truth. Help us to stand in your truth. And Father, help us to understand that the truth that we understand from you and that we will not carry out, we just don't believe you. And Father, help us to walk in belief today, not in unbelief. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hope you have a great day.